Hi, this is Bob Sorrentino from Italian Roots and Genealogy, and I'm here today with Randall Stefano. So welcome, Randall. Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks, Bob. Thanks for having me. Uh, so how long have you been doing your research? I guess I started back in the year 2000. We had come back from a trip uh, from Italy, and um, it, it really piqued my interest. And I got a hold of my father, who's 90 now. And uh, he had just very little information. He had a couple uh, death certificates. So I, I went by that, which was kind of confusing because my great grandfather, it says he was from Catania, but come to find out he was actually from Nicolosi and uh, his wife was also from Nicolosi in Sicily. So that's what got me started on it. And I ended up calling a cousin, my father's cousin, Marion out in California because he said she might have more information. And at that time, I don't think that she had too much more information than my father had. So I just uh, went through some documents and scratched my head and put some stuff together and uh, did the research up basically on my own. Yeah, you know, and I had similar things with um, with my father's uh, father. Same kind of thing with as far as the birth certificate. I was always told, first I was told he was born in Naples. Then I was told it was Caserta. Uh, and then eventually I found that it was, you know, when I finally got his birth certificate, it was Pagani. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> it does get confusing. And and my grandmother, uh, my father's mother, uh, same thing. I thought she was born in Naples and she was born close, but she was born in, in uh, Chircola. Uh, and that's great that your dad's still hanging in there. My dad would have been a hundred today. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and my great grandfather would have been, uh, let's see, uh, like 173 or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my father's in great shape. He really is in great shape. So we're we're hoping he he keeps on going and going. So, um, so the, so so once you found all of that, what kind of interesting things did you find out when you were researching the family? Uh, well, I think the uh, I started out in 2000 and um. I put together my first, my first book was, uh, his, my great grandfather's name was Giuseppe De Stefano, and uh, he was married to Grazia Pistorio. And um, I, I always heard about him I, in the cemetery up the road from where I grew up, uh, his gravestones there. And there was always a little porcelain medallion on the gravestone. It was of my, my great grandmother. And so I always knew about them and I, I i didn't know much about their their kids i knew my uncle al he lived down the street he um he owned a gas station in town so pretty much everybody in town knew alfred stefano and um we used to go there a lot and we just called him uncle al and he was always so so nice so kind uh but i didn't know anything else about my uh giuseppe and grazia had nine children yeah they actually had 10 they had a set of twins uh back in i think it was 1897 uh paul paul Paolo and Paula, but Paula died. She must have died shortly after birth because all I have is her birth record and I don't have anything else. I don't even have the death certificate, but I didn't know much about him. I had only met one other great uncle and it was Uncle Andy. So, and even my father didn't really know most of his uncles because they had all moved away. So I really wanted to dig deep and find out about him and, and uh, find out about uh, see pictures of them. I had never seen a picture of them. I got a, my first book. Uh, my cousin Marion sent me this picture. I know that your your the people listening won't be able to see it, but it's of my. It's the first picture I had ever seen of my great grandfather, and uh, it's actually the first picture my father had ever seen of him. My father knew him, but he died when my father was fourteen, so he didn't. You know, it was Gramps, you know, Grandpa or whatever he called him. I'm not sure what he called him at the time. So I really dug into it, and I got everybody that of. Uh, I, I finally connected all the nine kids together. I got all the pictures of all their, um, of, of them from different family members. And uh, I must have three, over 300 of his descendants in this book. And I put the book out and it was nice because I got to, the whole family is now connected back together through a Facebook page I started called the uh, Descendants of Gi Giuseppe De Stefano and Grazia Pistorio. So now all nine links of the family are all now tied back together again, which is uh, kind of fun. It gets to be fun. Yeah, it does, especially finding the long lost cousins is especially fun. Yeah, I had one uncle that was I, I just couldn't find and couldn't find. It was Uncle Victor. I'd never seen a picture of him. And um, it was in an obituary. I ended up finding him, his wife, 
by chance. It was out of the blue. I had uh, I had bought the subscription to a, a magazine company. Uh, they do newspapers, research and things like that. And East Hampton used to have a, a newspaper called the East Hampton Times. And I was scrolling through these these uh, th if you put in the, the name, it comes up in yellow on each one of these pages. So it came up to Stefano and I was looking and off the corner of my eye, I could see the N.O. in yellow. And I scrolled over there and I saw it was Victor and and uh, his wife at the uh, had just had a baby in Middlesex Memorial Hospital in Middletown. And it said the name Sa Sandra. So I'm like, and, and then I, I went and I found uh, his wife's name in an obituary. And then I was able to contact a granddaughter through Facebook. And I actually talked to her on the phone, uh, Denise. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So that's, it connected all nine. I got them all nine together, which was kind of exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So when they came to America, where did they first settle? Oh, um, my the The first person to come to America, his name was Pistorio. It was Grazia's uh, uncle. He came in 1891. And the... Uh, so the only record I have of him where he first lived is in East Hampton. And, um, and that was in census from 1900. Uh, East Hampton was, is, is, a big, is a, not a big town in Connecticut, but it had a lot of bell manufacturers. So there was a lot of work there. There was at least 10 companies that made bells in, in Connecticut. So he, I think he probably, he came here and was working there. And Giuseppe moved over in 1901 by himself with a few dollars in his pocket and, and moved in with... Uh, with Gaetano Pistorio, his uh, his uncle, Grazia's uncle. So uh, in, in the 1905, he went back and got Grazia. And they when they came back in 1905, they had um, Giuseppe Grazia and Anthony Antonini. His name was, and because uh, he was he was a newborn, but they left two of the boys behind. They left uh, uh, Paolo and Salvatore behind. And uh, and Grazia was also pregnant with my grandfather Gaetano, and and four months later that must have been interesting. You're taking me now to Italy, to America, and I'm four months pregnant. <laughs> so, so yeah, so they, they came over, and uh, he ended up going back in 1911 and getting the other two kids. But they all settled in East Hampton, and Giuseppe started working at the Bell Factory as well. He was a plater at the Bell Factory in East Hampton, Connecticut. Wow, that's an interesting profession. Yeah. 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 He went on to become very wealthy. He ended up uh, owning a meat market during the depression. He ended up owning, uh, being a real estate in, into real estate. He owned over 10 homes that he rented out in the town of East Hampton. Wow. That's pretty, so that's very that's well pretty for good. himself. And yeah. you know, it wasn't unusual for, um, to leave, you know, a couple of kids behind and then either go back and get them. In, in my case, my, my grandparents, left my uncle there and he didn't come over until 1950. Wow. With his whole family. So he had never met his mother. He, he never met his brothers and sisters until he was like 50 years old. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. These kids were in there. They were just about one of them was a teenager and one was just shortly younger and had been there for six years by themselves. With, I, I don't know who they were with. It could have been with their mother. Their mom was still alive. Their dad died. Uh, his, Giuseppe's dad died, I think, uh, 1850. He was only 52 years old when he died. He died young. So he must have been staying with his mother. Yeah, and that was, that was pretty early to come over in the 1890s. You know, yeah, most, 18... most of us came over in the, you know, early 1900s, 1910, right. 1915. Yeah, must, I, think, I think Gaetano must have been like a feeler, feeler gauge, feeling out the situation because <laughs> he was there for like, well, 11 years before Giuseppe came over. So, and then Giuseppe moved in with him. Yeah. And and so did they all, did they all wind up working at the, at the Bell factory? I find, I, I'm, I'm obsessed on the Bell factory now because I think that's so cool. <laughs> oh yeah, it's very cool. Yeah. There was two major Bell factories. There was the uh, Barton Bell company and there was another one, uh, the Bevan, Bevan Bells. And um, Bevan's still in, in uh, around today. Bell, Bevan Bells is the only working Bell factory. It's been in operation for about 200 years now. And they still they still make bills, but they all they they work there. Gaetano worked there. Gaetano actually, uh, Pistorio actually had a, a, a couple sons come over, and they were living there as well. And I just could never find anything on them. I don't know where they went. I don't know what cemetery they're buried in. They just sort of disappeared. And I and I can't. I only found the one census that's mentioned in 1910 of them. By 1920, they weren't living in East Hampton anymore. We'll be right back. Experience Italy like never before, traveling with a scheduled group or create your own bespoke tour with friends with PhilItaly.com. 
Pack your bags and follow Phil. That's www.philitaly.co. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's also an interesting place because um, you don't envision, an, you know, Italians going to East Hampton, Connecticut in 1890. <laughs> no, no. It, so I don't know where he got his info from, but he, he moved. By 1900, he was living there. I don't know where he was between uh, 1891 and 1900. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if they didn't, because I know some came in. Some Italians came in, I don't know the years, but I know some came in through Boston and some came in through Providence. So it's possible yeah. that they came in through there as opposed to coming oh, in through New York. No, they came in through New York. They did, yeah. Yeah, uh, Gaetano Pastorio came through New York and so did Giuseppe, yeah. Yeah, they all came through New York. But So I don't know why they moved into, um, into East Hampton other than maybe they had a, a heads up on possible work being there. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking, because I do know that, you know, they I do know that the Italians for a while in New York, they didn't have work and, and they would just come and ask people if you wanted to go work someplace. And, you know, you went. I know some of them went to Ohio and some went to Pennsylvania, you know, yeah. those type of things. So, yeah. Um, so now have you been back to the hometown? Oh, yeah, it was interesting. I went back uh, the first time ever. I went uh, this past year, me and my wife, we went to Sicily. We stayed in Catania outside of Castagna in a, a small town uh, right on the ocean. And then we drove into Nicolosi and which is Nicolosi is a town that's um, it's right on the foothills of Etna. Cause if you go to, if you actually go visit Mount Etna and go up on there, uh, take the, the um, uh, what is it? The, the gondola up to the top, you're actually in the town of Nicolosi, the whole tourist areas in Nicolosi, but the, it's not really a tourist town as far as going into Nicolosi. It's not that type of town, but people go, they pass through it. You see the buses all the time and they're headed to Etna. So we went there and I, I was, it was fascinating because I did all this research and I had all these names in my head. I know these people almost personally in my book now. And I went into the cemetery and it was like, it was crazy because um, all these names and faces, because they're all on the tombstone. Yes. Just like Giuseppe has a, porcelain medallion on his wife's back home uh all these had the porcelain medallions with pictures so i have a, a ton of pictures of the of these people in the book when i was seeing them i was like yep they're in my book yep they're in my book yep they're in my book so it's uh it was that was probably the highlight of the trip which is kind of a uh, morbid but going through the cemetery <laughs> but it was uh fascinating because the cemetery looks so small but when you get there it's all the way they do it in italy is they had these big, they're big buildings. They were like three stories tall and they had just tombs everywhere, just stacks and stacks and stacks. And there was probably eight big buildings filled. There were thousands of people in here in the same small little town. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what, you know, my cousin explained that to me when we were in Turkel and we went to where my great grandfather um, is, is buried. And, you know, they, they, after a while, they take the, the the bones and put them in like an ossuary box and put them in the, you know, put them in the wall, or for lack of a better word. Yeah. You know? Um. But we, I, he actually showed me, um, my, my grandmother's father's family. They actually had a um, um, a mausoleum type of thing, which was no longer in the family because, um, I think it was my great great grandfather sold it apparently he liked women and gambling oh. and uh, he sold a lot of stuff off uh and so it's it's was sold to another family but i don't think there's anybody at all in there anymore so the wealthier families would have that and then eventually move them out you know to to sell yeah, themselves I if I, I, if that's what i had heard but when i went to the one in nicolosi a lot of these um little uh, i don't know if they're called tombs or crypts uh, they've been there for you know, the ones I was putting in my book are early 1800s. So they've been there a long time. It, it doesn't look like they're ever moved out of there. And there's actually, um, you walk around, there's still flowers and all the little vases on mm -hmm. the sides. And they all have like a little light lighted candle next to them. And it's really kept up well. So I was surprised. The, the, I was looking for my great grandfather's father, Paolo there, but uh, I couldn't find him. And I took a picture of every single person in there by the name of De Stefano. I went through every single building and I spent probably three hours in the cemetery. My wife was, she helped for the first 15 <laughs> minutes and she's like, 
okay, I'm going to sit outside now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we have like, to... I, uh, hundreds of pictures of, uh, of <laughs> picture, yeah, of the tombs, yeah. Uh, so did you find any live relatives while you were there? Yeah, I did. I, it, was, <laughs> uh, it was interesting because when I was doing the book, I was I also on Facebook, I uh, contacted everybody that I could find in Nicolosi with the same last name. And uh, and it's another interesting point is they they spell it two ways in in, in uh, Nicolosi they spell it uh, like I spell it D I S -T, capital S T E F A N O or they just spell it as one word De Stefano no space no capital letters which I thought that was interesting but I did find a relative his name was Nino his name is Nino Alessandro he's about thirty eight years old and I contacted him and he actually sent me a picture of his of his grandparents. So they're in the book. And then I got some other pictures from other people that are in the book. But so when I went over there, I contacted him. He met me at the mother church right in the center of town. And we he, we, we tried to talk. I, I actually spoke more Italian than he spoke English because <laughs> he spoke no English. So that was that was interesting, but super nice guy. And uh, it was nice. To, it was a weird relation because his name's De Stefano, but we're related through a, a, a woman, Grazia De Stefano, who's like my third great aunt, and she married a Longo, and then they had a child named uh, Maria Grazia Longo, and she married a De Stefano. So, mm. so it's back into it again. But uh, yeah, so we're distant cousins, probably fourth or fifth cousins, or something like that. Um, yeah, and you know they. Um... It doesn't matter to them. A cousin is a cousin is a cousin, you know? It's yeah. It's funny. <laughs> yeah. They're still excited to meet you and everything. Yeah, he was pretty, he was pretty excited. He's a super nice guy. He got a couple books. I actually sent him uh, three books. They got lost in the mail because he he, he donated some pictures to me. And uh, they got lost. And all of a sudden, so I said, I'll just send him three more. So he got the three. And all of a sudden, he got the three more. So he... <laughs> <laughs> he gave him to all his cousins and he gave him to a 90 year old. He has a 90 year old uncle. And he said his uncle loved it. He saw all his relatives in the book. Yeah. The, the, um, the, 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 the mail system in Italy is, uh, is interesting to say the least. Yeah, and, it, and I yeah. tried, I, I had the same thing. I, I sent, um, I sent my cousin and his daughter some shirts and stuff like that. And, and um, it was stuck in UPS for, Boy, it must have been a month. Yeah. They they kept saying they couldn't find the address. And then you couldn't, you called them, they didn't answer the phone. And yeah. uh, you know, finally, 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 he he just had went there and picked it up himself. It was it was such a good, it was quite an adventure for sure. Yeah. For yeah, sure. It was stuck, it, it was, this one was stuck in customs. And I'm like, oh geez. They have a lot of laws in Italy about um I had when I, I had posted it for sale and on the page in Nicolosi, and uh, a couple of people said uh, you're not supposed to give out personal information. Uh, we don't yeah. have the we have the privacy laws here. And then a, a woman, I forget what her name was. She says, "I don't think they're going to mind the if the book stops in 1900. I don't think they're going to sue anyone." <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so now that's your your dad's family. Now, how about your mom's family? Uh, my mom's family is from Caserta, and uh, I. I, I would like to do a book on them, but the problem is even with doing a book, you know, doing this book with my own name to Stefano, I had trouble sometimes. The, the original book, this one I did on my own and I got it through church records, but the first one contacting people, they're not, some people aren't so willing to give up anything. If their name's not to Stefano, they're not personally connected. And since my mom's name's Fiorello, uh, I think it would be more difficult for me. And a lot of the information is lost because that whole generation is gone now. So I don't really, everybody that's alive now is like my age or a few years older, and they don't really have any information about the Fiorello family. So that one's kind of gone. Yeah. And, you know, I ran into kind of this similar type of stuff too, especially with my uh, my dad's father, I, I couldn't find anything on him online. I, I couldn't find hardly anything. And um, interestingly enough, my, my mom's family from Torito Bari, they all their records have been filmed and indexed. I don't know if maybe they started there, but for a small little town in the middle of nowhere, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff on the Antonati. Um, my dad's mom, I found things here and there, but because of who they were, it was once I found something, it was very, very easy to research. 
but I couldn't find Sorrentino for nothing. I couldn't <sighs> find, I, I knew, I knew that my grandfather had to be Achille because my oldest uncle was Achille. Searched and searched and searched. And then finally I, um, I hired somebody over there to help me find it. And he, he eventually found, uh, confirmed, you know, Achille. And, yeah. you know, I, I was able to go back, you know, several generations from there, but to your point about newspapers, I tell everybody the same thing. You never know what you're going to find. Yeah. I just, newspapers.com yeah, so had what one of those freebies one weekend. Yep. So I went in there and I typed in Sorrentino and I knew that my, my dad's family lived in Scotch Plains, New Jersey. Why? How? I have no idea. I know <laughs> that part of my grandma, at least my grandma's aunt lived in New Jersey at the time, but this is back in the twenties now. And, um, I found this local newspaper online and I must have found 20 or 30 little articles. They, they had like, I guess what you would call, um, uh, you know, a, a page where they would put local news or things like that, or I guess people could write in whatever they want. And I actually found references back to my grandmother's and grandfather's family in Italy in this little huh. paper in New Jersey in the 1920s. Mm. So you never know. You never you know. find stuff. Yeah, you don't ever know. I find stuff all the time. Uh, now I can get into that. Um, it's called the East Hampton News. I can get into it now through the East Hampton Public Library. They now have it printed. So I didn't know that then. I wouldn't have had to pay for that newspapers.com thing. But they, they have it actually online through the East Hampton Library. So I, if you go in and you can just punch in the last name and they just every page comes up with the, the last name on it. So it's, uh, it was really helpful. Yeah. So when you made the trip over to Italy, did you just go to Sicily? Did you go to hit the mainland at all? Or uh, We did quite a bit of Sicily. And then we went up to, um, we flew in from Catania, we flew into Naples and then we rented a car and did the entire Amalfi coast. Yeah. Did you take that road that with that one lane road along the mountains that, Oh yeah. <laughs> That's scary. What? <laughs> I loved it. My wife was freaking out. She was, uh, it's funny because she kept on telling me to slow down. And I'm like, people are passing me. You want me to slow down? <laughs> it's different when you're not the driver. Because yeah. it's, it's all like a cliff over here is a cliff. Yeah. 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 I, I did it. I did it 25 years ago. I this this trip, when we had this trip, I didn't drive. I just sat next to the driver. And, and um, but I, we, we stayed in Sorrento, so we took the drive through the you know Amalfi yeah. Coast, and I was just like, "This is scary stuff." And uh, th there were two guys on um, on a I guess like a it wasn't a moped, I guess like a scooter, and there were two guys, and they were holding like eight foot length of pipe, holding it as they're driving this road on a scooter. <laughs> It's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. Okay. I can't imagine. I see those buses and I see the people and like they're sitting up high in that bus and it just, it just looks like death to the left of you, <laughs> depending on which way you're going, you know, and these drivers, they're so good. The bus drivers are so good. Oh, they oh do yeah. No, they, they uh, in Naples, we had, we had a driver. He was excellent. And he had, uh, I guess it was like a 10 seat minivan type of thing. And the way he would maneuver through those streets in Naples, because you know what the streets in Naples are like, right? They're, They're crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. And, and I learned that don't try to dodge the scooters. They'll go around you. Yeah. The scooters have, they make their own rules in Italy. <laughs> they do. It, it's crazy because they'll, you'll get, you'll be in like a hairy mountain curve and the, there'll be a, a, a police officer directing traffic and telling everybody to stop. Scooters don't stop. They just go right around them because they're letting the other traffic come. The scooters don't care. They go anyway. And the, and the police don't care because no. they know scooters can fit. So they're not worried about them. <laughs> yeah. And I, I remember we drove, we drove from Naples to Sorrento and there was this big, long tunnel. And um, I guess I was behind like three or four cars. And, and there was a, there was, it was one lane each way. And this guy in this Lamborghini or something like that, he blew past all five cars in one shot, just, you know, revved it up to hundred and whatever. And when we got to the end of the tunnel, they actually had stopped them. And I said to my wife, I said, I guess 
passing five cars at one time at 150 miles an hour. That's even too much for the Italian police to deal with. <laughs> yeah, they had, I tell you what, you you you, you got to learn how to drive over there because if they have a second to get out into traffic, they're taking it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's why that's that's why, like I said, I didn't want to drive this time. Although, you know, there were certain spots, like if I went back, there were certain areas, uh, like out in the country, like driving through Sicily and stuff like that, where there's not a lot of traffic. Yeah. You know, you know, driving that road around. I'm sure you you took away, you, you know, you have the mountains on one side and the ocean on the other sea yeah. on the other side. It's it's incredible. How long were you there for? Uh, we were there for 23 days. Oh, super. Yeah, yeah wow. we, did, we did the whole Tuscany area too. We went up to Montepulciano, which is crazy beautiful. And there wasn't, and it's kind of the busy season when we went, but Montepulciano was just, there was, it seemed like there was nobody there. And it's such a beautiful town and the wine there is spectacular. And uh, we met some, some great people that own a, a wine shop there. And we couldn't get a dinner reservation in town. We just got there that night and we couldn't get a dinner reservation. And we had bought some wine from these people. And she, and she said, where are you going to dinner tonight? We said, well, we can't get a reservation. And she said, I'll get you a reservation. So she called this place that we had already called and went into and asked. And they said, no, we're booked. She called up. She booked us a reservation in that same place. <laughs> That's great. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you know, that. that they are like that. They're very accommodating. We, we, um, there's a vineyard on the side of Vesuvius, Sorrentino, not a relation. I wish they were. <laughs> um, but I said, once I saw that, I said, well, we have to go. I, yeah. I, can't, I can't go to Naples and not go to the Sorrentino vineyard on the side right. of Vesuvius. And it was fantastic. They had a, like a wine tasting lunch type of thing. And you were like, in a, it's in another world. Yeah. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it really is. The whole, the whole eating experience there is unbelievable. And the and the cost is compared to here is is so cheap. It's just crazy. Yeah, especially in the wine. You go in the supermarket. I didn't buy any supermarket wine this time. I did the first time we were there, but uh you go into the supermarket and you see the you know bottles of wine for like two euros or something like that. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah unbelievable. It's crazy. Yeah. But yeah, we did we did quite a bit of Italy. We were planning on going back this year, but I think we're going to do 2024. We're going to go with some friends from North Carolina, and we're going to go back and do. Um, uh, we're going to we're going to go to Sicily again, and then we're going to meet them up in uh, Montepulciano, and then we're going to drive up to uh, Cinque Terre, and because that's what they want to go. The, the thing about doing the Amalfi Coast is if. You you kind of want to do it when you're young because it's all stairs. Yes, you go, yeah. it's, it's it's all you're gonna go down. You got to come back up because <laughs> we had to carry our luggage. Uh, we got we we found a parking place, a parking garage in Positano, but then we had to walk to our our uh, our villa, which was beautiful. We stayed right in town and we had a view of the ocean and the view of the town. But we had to walk up 155 stairs with our luggage. Oh wow! Oh, I don't. Yeah. Think. So when we got up there, I had to get changed. I was like, <laughs> it had like rained on me. Yeah, it was. Uh, it, it's beautiful. Well, beautiful. we 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 did that in Sheila in Calabria, and and that was really such a beautiful place. But we didn't have to we didn't have to carry the luggage. But our hotel was at the top, and then you had we, the restaurants were all down by the sea, right. so you had to walk all the way down. Now they they have an elevator there. Oh, um, that's but nice. we took the elevator down. I don't know why we took the elevator down and then decided to walk up. And I was like every and it was like levels and every level I would look up and like, oh, boy, this is going to take forever. <laughs> and we would, you know, our kids are young. Our kids are 27 and 26. Yeah. We, we adopted them when, when we were older. And, you know, they're running up. <laughs> Come on. You know, it's taking you oh, so yeah. long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they have an elevator in uh, Siena as well. We we went to Siena for a, a day trip, which is another it, that was really packed. Siena was really packed, and another beautiful town. But uh, we we found a parking spot. She said, I'm, "It says there's an elevator to get up there." I said, "Really?" So we go up there, and it was it was actually escalators, and it was like had to have been eight different escalators, you know, going all the way up, and, and it took you right into just at the outskirts of town. It was beautiful. Yeah. When were you there? What month were you there? You were there in the uh, summer? We were there in, uh, was it March? Jeez, I don't even remember now. I'm getting old. I don't remember. That's four months ago about. Yeah. And it oh, was okay. uh, it was really warm in Sicily. Really warm. 
Yeah, that's a, that's because because I know uh, well when we went we went in June, and typically June's not that hot, but it was like really really hot, and um, they were just starting to relax all of the COVID rules, you know, and um, they had said we needed to we needed to have an updated test before going to the Vatican and all of that kind yeah. of stuff, and yeah. we had the test here to go over. And what happened was it was expiring and we had this tour booked in the Vatican, right? So I said to my wife, I said, if we get tested again and test positive, <laughs> we're not going to be able to do anything else. Right. So I, I said, you know, maybe we'll just let the reservations go. And on the way back, we'll go. And it's the way if we have to test anyway to come home. But then they they stop that. Um, and then I said, you know what? Let's just go. I said, if they ask for the thing, we'll show them. If they say we can't go in, we can't go in. Well, we get yeah. there. There's 10 million people there. Nobody's asking for anything. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's on top of each other. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. We didn't even go in. We were, we did a, a day and actually we ended up doing two days in Rome, but we, we did it the first day in Rome. We wanted to go in years ago, back in 2000, I went with my, my two boys, two young boys. They were just one, one guy I was wearing on my back and we went into that little yeah. shop. We went to that little shop by the Vatican and I was going to buy some some stuff for the family. I bought a couple crosses and things like that. And then the following year, I went back with my brother and uh, my brother, Steve, and his wife, Sherry. And I'm, I'm in line. And I said to my wife, I said, that's the same nun that was here last time we were here last year. So I keep I keep looking at her and she's looking at me when I get up to the counter. She goes, I remember you. Wow. From the previous year. And I'm like, I said, I remember <laughs> you. So, yeah. And we bought some more stuff. But, yeah, we didn't go in this time because it was so crowded. And we had been in before. But the, the, it, it just looked like the, it was going to take us an hour and a half, two hours to get in. And, you know, when you're in Rome, you just want to walk around and do things. So, yeah, I mean, we did it. We did it because because of the kids. If it wasn't because of the kids, oh, yeah. I, don't, I don't think we, you know, we probably would have waited online. Yeah. And, and the first time. Same thing. My son, when we went the first time, he was a baby. He was on my back, you know, and, yeah. and we and we couldn't go into we couldn't go into St. Peter's with him. We had to go in separate because we couldn't. I don't think I had the thing, but you couldn't bring the stroller in there. And so, oh, right. so uh, I went inside and I was I don't know how long I was in there for. When I come out, my wife says, what were you doing in there? I said, <laughs> well, when you get in there, yeah. you've never seen a church this big. <laughs> right. Wait and see. <laughs> I could have spent more time in there. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah. I was like rushing around. I said, you'll see how big it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's incredible. incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is amazing. And we, we didn't go into the Sistine Chapel that first time. So, and, and that's what took so long because there were so many people there. It was, it was crazy. Um, and then we did, you know, we, then, like you said, we, it's a great town to walk around in and, yeah. and yeah. You, you know, every turn there's some part yeah. of history yeah we've been there four times so we, we know rome pretty well because we get there we'll spend a day there and then we'll go someplace else but uh yeah we know rome pretty well it's uh it, it is beautiful beautiful to walk around it's amazing when you, you forget how big the Colosseum is until you get there you know because yeah. you see pictures of it and you say eh, it doesn't look very big but uh, you get there and it's like it, tall it's just enormous and for anybody who goes I didn't know this when we were there. You have to buy the tickets online. We, we thought we were going to go. The first time we went there 25 years ago, there was nobody there. You could practically just walk right in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. now you have to, you know, get a reservation and do all yeah. that. Yeah, so, and we've been in before, so we didn't go in. So a lot of stuff, we just walk around now. But basically, when we go to Italy, we go to the restaurants. We're looking for restaurants. That's what we do. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's the thing to do. I uh, we I mean, the most amazing meal that we had was when we were in Calabria at, at the... Um, one of the hometowns where they had a, you know, like a picnic for us and everything was, you know, the cheese was homemade and the wine was homemade and the olive oil was homemade and bread was homemade. Yeah. And it's so matter of fact to them, like, yeah, don't you have this over there? I'm like, no, we don't have this over there. No. <laughs> so, no. You know, our, 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 uh, you know, our salami is cured in three days. It's not, it's yeah. not cured. Oh, it's just incredible. We were sitting down, we were eating at a place, you know, we, we started in, in Sicily and we ate so much fish. And I said to my wife, I just want a big piece of steak. And uh, the waiter says, where, where are you going next? So we're going up towards uh, the Amalfi coast and then we're doing Tuscany. He goes, 
wait till you get to Tuscany and mm-hmm. buy your steak there. So we went up there and they sell it by the, the gram or however it is. And he brings out, we, we wanted to get one. He brings out this steak. It's absolutely enormous. And it was thick. And he, and I, I said, he said, it's going to be 75 euros. And we're like, fine. It was enormous. We both split it, which, you know, it's more than $75, but I was dying to have a piece of steak <laughs> and it was so good. The best steak I had in a long time, but, uh, and we were eating and, you know, you, you know how they do it there. They give you all these different courses. You start mm-hmm. you, by the end of it. And we, my wife said to him, how you have all these courses. How, I don't understand how you, how you eat all this. And the waiter says, we like to eat in Italy. <laughs> But they also spend most, they'll spend a good part of the day there in the restaurant. They'll spend yeah. an hour or two in the restaurant sitting around talking and eating. Yeah, yeah. No, no we, we noticed that too. We, our steak experience was goes back to when I lived in uh, England for two years. And it was right when Mad, Mad Cow was out. And you couldn't, you couldn't, not that you couldn't eat beef, but we were kind of like trying to stay away from it. Right. So we went to Brussels and, um, we ordered a Chateau Beyond in, in this nice restaurant in Brussels. And the same thing, I mean, they came out with this big hunk of meat. Oh. <laughs> we were just like so desperate for beef that we, yeah. I think oh, yeah. we ate almost the whole thing. Yeah, we were we were dying. We had so much fish. Not that <laughs> I mean, we loved the fish. The best meal I had was down in Sicily. It was the uh, linguine and clams at a restaurant. I wanted to get another plate. My wife said, just get one. I said, no, I don't want to feel like a pig. I was already stuffed anyway, but it was so good. Yeah, and I'm you know I'm not a big fish eater, but when we were in Sheila, um, they hooked us up for a fish restaurant, and I was like, you know, maybe I should change. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm here. I'll I'll, I'll do. It. And it was so good. I mean, it's like they stick their hand in the water and you know pull the fish out. You know. Oh yeah, it's all it's all fresh, especially in Sicily. I mean, it's an island. It's just surrounded, and the, the, the Catania fish market in Catania is absolutely phenomenal to see to walk through it and all these these vendors selling fish and just it's just crazy everybody's trying to sell you some fish and i took a video but it's uh it's fun we've been there a few times and catania is beautiful what a beautiful town that is yeah we didn't we didn't get that we went to uh because we only spent a couple of days in sicily we went to we took the ferry from sheila to to messina and then um when we had the car to go to cefalu and, and i had a good friend there um, and he's, he lives about 20 minutes from Chefalu. So he took us around the town and, uh, interest introduced us to the spritz and things like that. Oh. Uh, and then we spent a couple of nights in Palermo because my, my wife's, uh, family is her mom's family's from Shaka. Uh, so we went over there and that was, we went on a Sunday, so it was really quiet, but that was just so serene and peaceful and quiet, yeah. you know, uh, really, really nice. Um, but Palermo was fun because they, they booked us a couple of nights to eat in the street, you know, oh. uh, and that's for anybody who goes, that's a great experience to be. Yeah. They have the that huge table set up. Is that what it is? Yeah. They, they, well, it's, it's a street, I guess it must be, you know, maybe four or five blocks long, like, you know, New York style blocks long. Right. And all the restaurants just have all their tables in the street. So it's like one big, you know, food party. If you yeah. will. That's nice. Uh, and yeah. it was, you know, it was, I, I guess they did it because it's probably, a, you know, especially it was a Saturday night. So it's probably a typical thing that the, the because there weren't, a, there weren't really any tourists there. It was pretty much all Italians yeah. uh, there. Yeah. Uh, and that's the best part about it when you get outside of all the touristy type places and everything, you know? Well, that's like uh Nicolosi where my family's from. There's, there's, it, it seems like there's no tourism there because we were walking, we walked around there for two days and it seemed like we were the only people on the street, you know? Uh, shops shops were open a little later, which was where they had weirder hours than most most of Italy. It didn't. It's like they didn't open until four o'clock. Some of them, at all, and uh, there's just there's just nobody there. It's uh, except they're all just in buses going to the mountain to the the volcano. Yeah, so it's yeah. A, it's like a I guess a stopover place or something, right? Before they yeah, and there's no place. I mean, it's not even a town you'd stop in to go do shopping or anything like that. It's more of just it's only a population of sixteen hundred, so it's a small little wow. it's a small town. Everybody knows each other, you know. I tried to get information from the town hall there; they weren't cooperative at all. I went. It was funny because I went in. I just wanted. I had already done my research, but I just wanted a death certificate on my great aunt who I who died in at either at birth or shortly after birth, Paula. 
And I had another doc. I just wanted to see the uh, another a document of my great great grandfather. And I went in with two pieces of paper, and I went in and I said, I said, Scusi. And the woman behind the counter put her hand up to say no. She never came to me, never approached me. She didn't know I was there or nothing. And I just looked at her and she says, no, again. And she turned around and looked at the guy in the back office. And he just looked at me and put his head back down. And I'm like, and I, I, I was like dumbfounded. And I, I just walked out of there confused, like what happened here? So, <laughs> so I just went out to talk to my wife. I said, they, they wouldn't talk to me at all. for And, and I don't know what it was. They, they didn't explain if they were closing or what's going on. So, you know, that was upsetting. But then I went across the street to the tourism de uh, department. It was a man by the name of uh, Matteo Galvana. And he was he couldn't speak any English at all. But uh, he was super friendly, super nice. And he tried to get us. He said, can we come back tomorrow? He'll take me over there personally. And we were the next day was Saturday. We were leaving. We we're getting on a flight to go up to uh, Naples. And I said, I can't. Because he told me that the place wasn't closed, they're still they were still open, but he he was getting ready to shut down as well. So, but he was very helpful and very nice. And uh, but it was, I mean, Nicolosi is a pretty town. They have a beautiful church. You know, they've got the Mount Etna, and we went up there. We took a uh, uh, Nino, my cousin, distant cousin, has a friend by the name of Stefano. Uh, his his name is Domenico, and he he helps run the um, outdoor adventure stuff on Mount Etna. And he said, go up there and see him. He's not related. He's not originally from uh, from Nicolosi. And um, so we went up there. We met him. He took us on a private uh, quad tour of the mountain. And uh, so it was we had a lot of fun. Oh, really, that's nice. Yeah, yeah we really nice. we saw most of the most of the sites I wanted to see in uh, Nicolosi. I saw the volcano. I wanted to I wanted to walk on Mount Rossi. Those are two um, mountains that small mountains that were created by the eruption of 1669 and now it's like an adventure trail up there and biking path and uh but we didn't get to that but you could see it from everywhere and um so i want we're going to go back i want to go back in uh, next year and, and go, go back to nicolosi at least one more time yeah we're hoping to go in you know maybe in september if if, if not then definitely same thing you know 2024 for sure yeah. before i get too old to to go um yeah well Randall, this has been a lot of fun. I appreciate you taking the time. So for anybody who wants to buy the book, is it on is it on sale? Yeah. No, because it's not really that kind of book. I've had people ask about it as well. It's it's more of a, a stats book. It, it documents every single person by the name of De Stefano that was went through the mother church and all the churches in that town. So it's 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 basically names, it's all family trees. So mm -hmm. There's, there's no stories in it or things like that. It's just a connection of families and it connects them together. If it had gone, if I could have gone back another generation or two, I could have tied them even closer together, but I could only go back to 1620 with, uh, with the town records. Well, that's pretty good. That's pretty, yeah. far. pretty far. That's not bad. Pretty and far. you also, you mentioned now a Facebook group too, didn't you? I think. Yeah. I have a Facebook uh, group. I started, so uh, uh, just the family of Giuseppe Di Stefano and Grazia Pistorio on Facebook. Yeah. And it's got, uh, I think we have 80 members and they're all from all nine lines of the family. Great. Great. Yeah. That's super. All right. Well, listen, thanks again. I appreciate it. Stay warm up there in Vermont. All right, Bob. Thanks. Nice talking to you. Hi everyone. This is Bob Sorrentino. Just letting you know that my new book Farmers and Nobles is now available for sale on www dot italian genealogy dot blog backslash farmers and nobles or you can find the link in the podcast notes thanks for listening <laughs>